Exercise 2124 is asking you to predict the products of reactions with esters. And like carboxylic acid derivatives in general, when you see them, you want to see the group that's bonded to the carbonyl carbon that defines the carboxylic acid derivative as a leaving group. So here we have a carbonyl carbon bonded to the oxygen, and to the right of it we have an ether. Now that defines an ester. And with an ester, this methoxy group, oxygen with the methyl group, is going to be our leaving group. So if you're just trying to draw a rough draft from the perspective of synthesis of what product you might get in this reaction, you can draw the same molecule, but instead of the leaving group, you can draw your nucleophile. Now your nucleophile in LAH, which is lithium aluminum hydride, the nucleophile is the hydrogen. I'm going to draw the mechanism for this separately, very quickly, after this, but first I just want to look at it from the perspective of synthesis. Now if you only added one equivalent of lithium aluminum hydride, you would end up turning the ester into an aldehyde, as here. However, we have excess lithium aluminum hydride, and the truth is lithium aluminum hydride is such a strong hydrogen nucleophile that it also reacts with aldehydes, as we saw in the previous chapter. So it would react with this again and replace a bond to the oxygen with another bond to a hydrogen. The oxygen, meanwhile, gets protonated by this water, as I'll show you in the mechanism. So this is the ultimate product. Now, normally in these skeletal structures, the hydrogens aren't drawn, they're implied. And so the final product would, would on a test would often look maybe like this, on like a standardized test that had them drawn in, like the MCAT or PCAT or a DAT. And so that's it. You have two equivalents of hydrogen nucleophiles adding on to the carbonyl carbon. They end up reducing it, replacing bonds to oxygen with bonds to hydrogen. So that's the synthesis. And if that's all you're interested in, you can scrub to the next section where you see me going over B. For now, I want to talk about the mechanism for this very quickly. So what we have is our molecule with the methoxy group here. We know that the carbonyl carbon is slightly electrophilic, not the strongest electrophile, because the lone pairs on the oxygen are contributing some electron density through resonance. They're allylic to the pi bond. But it's a decent electrophile, at least. LAH, lithium aluminum hydride, is sometimes written as LiAlH4. That gives you a little bit more information about the structure. You have an aluminum with four hydrogens around it, the conceptual thing you should notice here is that aluminum is a metal and therefore has very low electronegativity. It loses its electron density to the hydrogens, which therefore become nucleophilic. So you have this hydrogen nucleophile. Now that's the ALH4. The lithium in lithium aluminum hydride is there to stabilize the charge that this aluminum hydride has. Altogether it has a negative charge, and the lithium is countering that with its positive charge. So what ends up happening is the hydrogen acts as a nucleophile. It uses its electrons to attack the carbonyl carbon. The electrons swoop up, and we have a tetrahedral intermediate after that nucleophilic attack. So this oxygen would have a full negative charge, and we would have a hydrogen, this hydrogen, bonded below. Excuse me. Now that oxygen has a full negative charge and is very unstable. And so it snaps back down and kicks off the methoxy group. Now the methoxy group is not a good leaving group, but it's just as unstable as this oxygen here. So you create an equilibrium where each oxygen has its sort of time to shine. Each oxygen has to deal with a ne full negative charge. So at this point, we have this aldehyde, and we have a methoxy group floating around in the solution. If you were using water as a solvent, that methoxy group would get protonated and turn into methanol. But here we're following the story of this carbon chain. And now that we have this aldehyde, another equivalent of lithium aluminum hydride, notice that we have excess in the original recipe. 
we have more than one equivalent, we have excess. So here, that same aluminum, or that same hydrogen nucleophile can attack the carbonyl carbon and send the pi bond electrons onto the oxygen. So that turns the molecule we had into another sort of tetrahedral intermediate, but this time the oxygen can't snap back down because they, we have no good leaving groups. If you compare the tetrahedral intermediate we had before, which at least had an, a possible leaving group, here we only have hydrogens and carbons, which are truly exceptionally bad leaving groups. They're very unable to stabilize a full negative charge. So this oxygen can't snap back down and kick something else off. So the best thing we can do is stabilize it with a proton transfer. And if you look back up at the recipe, the second step is water. The water puts a hydrogen on that oxygen. So the negative oxygen steals the hydrogen, the electrons snap onto that oxygen of water, and you get, after that proton transfer, you get this product, which, if you just draw it as a skeletal structure without drawing the hydrogens in, it would look like the structure on the right. And the hydrogens are still there, they're just implied. And you'll notice that that is the exact product that we drew above when we were predicting the, the product through synthesis. Okay, so the big conceptual takeaway there is lithium aluminum hydride is a strong hydrogen nucleophile that replaces the leaving group twice. Ultimately, it takes an ester here down to an alcohol. Okay, next, in B. You'd look at the carbon skeleton. You'd see that it's a carboxylic acid derivative, that it's an ester. Carbon double bonded to an oxygen, single bonded to an ether. The OME, the methoxy group, is going to be our leaving group. We're going to replace that with whatever our nucleophile is. So let's think about this just from the perspective of synthesis, and then we can think about the mechanism afterwards. So just from the perspective of synthesis, which is all you'd have to know for the test, you can see that your nucleophile is going to be the ethyl group. Remember that you have two carbons, that ET stands for CH3, CH2, and that middle CH2 is going to be bonded to magnesium bromide. A similar thing happens here, as happens in lithium aluminum hydride, where the metal has very low electronegativity, and so the carbon bonded to it turns in to the nucleophile. And that nucleophile is what's going to replace our leaving group. So to draw a sort of draft, rough draft, of the possible product that we could make, you would draw the same molecule just without the leaving group, and with, there's one, two, our two carbons of the nucleophile. So that's one possible product, yet Grignard reagents, and you'll recognize them by the MGBR, where the magnesium is bonded to a carbon, Grignard reagents are strong carbon nucleophiles, just like lithium aluminum hydride is a strong hydrogen nucleophile. And so if you have more than one equivalent of them, they won't just react with the carboxylic acid derivative, they will also react with aldehydes and ketones a second equivalent will come in. And in that case, you would replace the double bond to the oxygen with just one bond and another ethyl group. So here we have our original ethyl group and then another ethyl group that's being, um, that's replacing that pi bond there. The oxygen that's left over ends up stealing a hydrogen from water in the second step, and so it becomes an alcohol. And so that would be the product you'd expect for this reaction. Now, that's from the perspective of synthesis. Let's quickly, quickly walk through the mechanism here. And you'll see that it's very similar to the mechanism for lithium aluminum hydride. So if we have our carboxylic acid derivative, our ester, we can take our carbon nucleophile and have it attack the carbonyl carbon. Now this magnesium and bromine would float off in solution. The magnesium really ends up having a positive charge. The carbon nucleophile would attack the carbonyl carbon, kick the pi bond electrons 
up above. So when you get that nucleophilic attack, you would get a tetrahedral intermediate. So you'd still have the methoxy group there, the oxygen, but now it would have a full negative charge, and an ethyl group. So that's our two carbons. That oxygen with a full negative charge is very unstable, so it snaps back down and kicks the methoxy group off, the leaving group. This is Notice that this is not acid-catalyzed because we have a very strong nucleophile. You just need to use an acid catalyst if you have a weak nucleophile. And so the methoxy group leaves. We have a pi bond to the oxygen now, and we have the two carbons that we added. Notice this is the first intermediate that we predicted here. I just need to add that methyl group in from the beginning. So this methyl group here would go here and here. So that's the product we predicted from the beginning. But we have another Grignard reagent. If you look at the recipe, there is excess Grignard reagent. So we have another equivalent, and that strong nucleophile can definitely attack the carbonyl carbon of a ketone, or an aldehyde for that matter. You can attack that carbonyl carbon, send the electrons up onto the oxygen, so that you end up with another ethyl group added, and the oxygen has a full negative charge. So the two ethyl groups, one, two, one, two. In the last step, now, this oxygen is very unstable. It would love to form another pi bond, but we have no good leaving groups. All of the things attached here are carbons or hydrogens, but here they're all carbons, and so they're terrible leaving groups, so they're not going to come off. The best we can do is stabilize this negative charge by doing a proton transfer with water. And you'll notice in the recipe, the second step is water to do that proton transfer. So we would have a water molecule, and the negative oxygen will attack one of those hydrogens. The electrons would snap onto the oxygen of water, and we would end up with this tertiary alcohol as our product. And that's the same product that we predicted when we were just thinking about synthesis. Let me add in this methyl group here, just kept forgetting. So, so there we go. That's the same product we would have predi we predicted through synthesis. All right. Now, this happens through a very similar mechanism, C. So let's just talk about it from the perspective of synthesis. We look at the molecule, we see a carboxylic acid derivative, an ester, carbon double bonded to oxygen, single bonded to an ether. The leaving group here is the uh, ether the ether oxygen. And so this structure, when you have a cyclic ether, is called a lactone. What you can end up doing as a rough draft is redrawing the molecule just with the leaving group gone. So you'd have that double bond there, the leaving group is still on the molecule on the other end, but it's not attached to the carbonyl. And then you're going to replace that with your nucleophile. Now here our nucleophile, as we've seen, is hydrogen. So you'd replace that with a hydrogen. However, lithium aluminum hydride is a strong nucleophile. And so, and we have excess of it. So one equivalent will just, won't just act. Another hydrogen will, nucleophile will attack that carbonyl carbon and replace it with a second hydrogen. The water wash at the end fills in the hydrogens through proton transfers onto those oxygens there. So that the final product that you'd get, if you wanted to draw it without, if you wanted to draw it just as a skeletal structure, first I'll draw it without the hydrogens, and then I'll draw it in a way that you're more likely to see on a standardized test. So here you have one, two, three, four, five carbons. So you would see it as one, two, three, four, five carbons. You have an OH on carbon number one and an OH on carbon number five. And so that would be your product. 
just looking at this from the perspective of synthesis. Okay, in terms of the mechanism, how would that lactone break apart? So I'll go through this just very quickly because it's a nucleophilic acyl substitution, as we've seen so many examples of. Lithium aluminum hydride has the aluminum bonded to the four hydrogens. That whole thing has a negative charge that's stabilized by the positive charge on lithium. Aluminum is a metal, so it has very low electronegativity, and the hydrogens, comparatively, are more electronegative and steal its electron density, become slightly negative. They can then act as a nucleophile. One of them can go in and attack the carbonyl carbon, kicking its pi electrons up. So here we have nucleophilic attack. After the nucleophilic attack, we have a tetrahedral intermediate. This molecule reappears, but the pi bond isn't there anymore. Instead, we have a negative charge on that oxygen and a hydrogen. This hydrogen was our hydrogen nucleophile attaching to what was the carbonyl carbon. Now that oxygen is very unstable, so it snaps back down to create a pi bond and kicks off the other oxygen as a leaving group. And so here you end up with a double bond to the oxygen. You have this oxygen now that's left has a full negative charge, and a hydrogen has taken its place, this hydrogen here. Well, that would be the end of the story, except we have excess lithium aluminum hydride. And so another equivalent of lithium aluminum hydride comes in. Oops. Another equivalent of lithium aluminum hydride comes in. One of the hydrogens acts as a nucleophile with its electrons, attacks the carbonyl carbon, kicks the pi electrons up, and then you get That oxygen is still there. Like before, we still have a hydrogen there, but now we have a second one, and the oxygen is there with a full negative charge. Now, this is as reduced as we could possibly get it. A lithium aluminum hydride would love to attack another, car another electrophile, but there's no electrophile here for it to attack. And so, instead, these, can't, these negative oxygens, the only thing we can do with them is stabilize them. And we do that with water. So you see at the end of this recipe, we had a water wash in the second step. And you do want to separate it from the first step because lithium aluminum hydride could react with the water. So you'll separate this as a second step. The negative oxygens, one of them will steal a hydrogen from one water molecule. And give you a product. and the other will steal a hydrogen from another water molecule and give you the product. So that ultimately here, you have a diol two alcohols. Now notice, in this example, we have one, two, three, four, five carbons. So if you wanted to redraw this in a more conventional way, you could have one, two, three, four, five carbons with an OH on each end. Now that is the same molecule that we drew and predicted through the synthesis step. Notice that this was really just Nucleophilic, a nucleophilic acyl substitution followed by the reduction of an aldehyde. So we turned an a lactone into a diol. All right. Now in D, we've, this is the 
acid-catalyzed hydrolysis of an ester. So we've drawn the mechanism for this so many times in previous videos d devoted to that topic that I won't draw the mechanism here. We'll just think about the synthesis process. You look at this carboxylic acid derivative, you'd see an ester, carbon double bonded to oxygen, single bonded to an ether. The ethoxy group, in general, the alkoxy group, is going to be your leaving group. So when you're trying to come up with a rough draft of your product, draw the same molecule just without that leaving group. It's going to leave. And as we know from the acid hydrolysis of esters, acid catalyzed hydrolysis of esters, our nucleophile here is really an OH. There are a lot of proton transfers that have to happen first, but ultimately the nucleophile is an OH, and this acid catalyzed hydrolysis replaces the ethoxy group with an OH, turns a, an ester into a carboxylic acid. The, the OET, the, eth, the ethoxy group, ultimately leaves as well and gets protonated by the acid and turns into ethanol. So just like we saw in the video that showed how triglycerides separate in the acid-catalyzed acid hydrolysis of esters, you can take an ester, treat it with acid, and get a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. So I'm not going to draw the mechanism for that only because we've drawn it so many times in previous videos. Okay, this is a maybe less complicated but and and really familiar reaction, but it's maybe out of seems a little out of left field here. So this ultimately has is an SN2 reaction that's happening that's taking advantage of the acidity of a carboxylic acid. So we know this hydrogen here is acidic because if it leaves, the negative charge that's left behind is stabilized through resonance. So you could treat that with a base, and here we have sodium hydroxide. Remember, the sodium is a metal, it gives its electrons away to whatever it's bonded to, here the oxygen, which then has a full negative charge, and so can act as a strong base in a strong nucleophile. It could act as a nucleophile, but what would it be replacing? Replace an OH with an OH, what do you accomplish? So the other reaction that can happen, that does make a difference, is this can act as a base and attack this slightly positive hydrogen and let the electrons snap back onto the carboxylic acid oxygen there. And what you get is a molecule called a carboxylate. A carboxylate is what a carboxylic acid is called after it loses its acidic hydrogen. This one, and actually here we had sodium originally, this carboxylate, the original acid was benzoic acid, the carboxylate of benzoic acid is benzoate. And because this sodium is balancing the charge there, this is sodium benzoate. The next time you eat guacamole, look in the ingredients list. You will see sodium benzoate there, it's acting as a preservative. Okay, so who cares? What's the big deal about doing that acid-base reaction? How does that influence what happens next? What we have here in the second step is ethyl iodide, so CH3CH2 bonded to an iodine. And what that should remind you of, that ethyl iodide, is a substitution reaction. You spent so much time in Organic Chemistry 1 uh, noticing leaving groups, and the halogens are classic leaving groups. Anytime you have a leaving group, you could do substitution or elimination. Well, here you can do substitution. This is on a primary carbon, and so it's going to be an SN2 reaction. This nucleophilic oxygen with the full negative charge, although it's actually a partial negative charge when you take into account the resonance that's happening here, that can attack this carbon and kick the leaving group off. So we have nucleophilic attack and loss of a leaving group happening at the same time that's an SN2 reaction. And what we get is an ester. So the carboxylate is bonded to now an ethyl, an ethyl group. So there's one, two carbons here, one, two carbons there. So this would be ethyl benzoate is the name of this one, this ester. And that is the full mechanism for this 
which um, I wanted to draw because it was a little unusual. It's maybe it's not a nucleophilic acyl substitution, so the shortcut method we've been using for the synthesis problems wouldn't work with this one. Okay, last but not least, we have another lactone. You'd see the carboxylic acid derivative here. We have the carbonyl with an ether on one side, so that's an ester. If you have an ester in a ring, it's called a lactone. So we have a lactone. And we've actually treated a lactone with excess Grignard reagent in water before. So we did that above. We did that here. Now, this was not uh, Grignard. This was a lithium aluminum hydride, but the principle is going to be the same. It's just instead of adding two hydrogens, because that's what the nucleophile is here, we're going to add two carbon nucleophiles. So after you've written these down, you might compare D with or you might compare this next one that we're going to do, E, with um, C. So compare C with... Oh, sorry, compare C with F. F, this one we're about to do. C and F. They're very similar. So we're going to take this lactone, and ultimately, we notice the leaving group. We're going to replace that leaving group with our nucleophile. So you can redraw the molecule exactly as it is. Just don't connect that oxygen to the carbonyl. Now our nucleophile here is one of the carbons in the ethyl group. We have ethyl magnesium bromide. That would look like this. And really, this is almost an ionic bond. So this carbon here is very slightly negative, very slightly negative, and the magnesium is very slightly positive, so that you have this carbon nucleophile here. So if you replace this with your carbon nucleophile, the two carbons there, one, two, one, two, then that's the product you would get. However, ethyl magnesium bromide is a strong carbon nucleophile. It won't just react with carboxylic acid derivatives, it will also react with aldehydes and ketones, which is what we have here. So it could take that ketone and add a second equivalent of an ethyl group onto it. Replace one of the bonds to the, the pi bond to the oxygen with a sigma bond to another ethyl group. The water in the second step adds hydrogens onto these oxygens. And so that would be the product you'd predict there, just from the perspective of synthesis. If you wanted to see that from the perspective of the mechanism, let's, I'll draw that now. So we have this benzene ring with a lactone attached. The carbon in the carbonyl is a, an electrophile. It's not the best electrophile, especially here with all the resonance that's going on. Notice that these are conjugated, but it's an electrophile nonetheless. And that is enough because our nucleophile is very, very strong. It is a Grignard reagent. So we have this ethyl group with lone pair being stabilized ionically almost by this magnesium bromide. So this negative charge here, this swoops in, attacks the carbonyl carbon, kicks the pi electrons up, nucleophilic attack. We get a tetrahedral intermediate. The oxygen will have a full negative charge, and now we are going to have an ethyl group attached as the fourth bond. Now the oxygen is very unstable, so it snaps back down to recreate the pi bond and kicks the oxygen off. So that's loss of a leaving group. So now we still have the benzene ring, and we have a double bond to this oxygen with an ethyl group attached. On the other side we have one, two carbons, and an oxygen which now has a full negative charge. The Grignard reagent is a strong carbon nucleophile, and so a second equivalent can come and attack this ketone. The pi bond gets kicked up, and we have a sort of second tetrahedral intermediate after this nucleophilic attack. So, similar to the structure we had before, but no pi bond 
and a negative charge on the oxygen, and another ethyl group attached, this ethyl group that we added here. Now, there's no good leaving group here, so this can't snap back down. The best we can do is add water, as we always do with these Grignards, to do proton transfers and stabilize the oxygens. So, we'll do two proton transfers. First, one from the oxygen on top. And second, one from the oxygen on the bottom. And that gives us our product. And that is the same product that we predicted up here in the synthesis step. So hopefully that gives you a sense of how some of these nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions can work with esters.